attacks on religious Americans mounting in the media. So you can see Christians are being slaughtered all over the place. Here in the USA, verbal attacks Because there does seem to be a rising hostility against Christians across this country because of our biblical views. We're now smearing Americans. There are no great religions. They're all stupid and religious. <laughs> So I talked about it a little bit at camp this week, so hopefully you can finish my sandwiches, that's what I was going to say. Good? Okay. Uh, just stop. Just stop. Don't patronize me. Okay. So the idea behind this is simple. Um, I think one of the problems with our church is we're trying so hard to be in power. Historically speaking, there's a uh, little verse in Scripture. It's in Matthew chapter 16. If you have your Bible, let's go ahead and open to it. Matthew chapter 16. I'll use some context as you guys are turning there. So Jesus is uh, with his disciples, and he takes them to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Okay, so Caesarea Philippi is a place that basically um, it's what we consider we we would consider hedonistic. Hedonistic, H E D O H E D O N I S M, hedonism is basically um, complete indulging of the flesh, right? So no real moralistic value. Everything is is postmodernistic. Everything is pluralistic. In other words, if it feels right for you, do it. And that really it went to the extent of everything that it was. So, I mean, they would literally have parades where they would try to allure the, the, um, the god Pan out of his hole that was there in the side of the cliff. And they thought that that was the, the uh, it was called Hades. It's, so the, god, the goat god Pan, he was one of these, he was a deity. And then what he would do is every year he would go visit his father in hell. Hades was his dad, okay, based on their traditions and everything else like that. So Hades... Or, so Pan, the goat god, would then retreat, but he also brought water to the Jordan every year. So the, the Jordan is what kind of uh, would water all the crops in the ancient Near East, going through this one part, particularly where Jesus would be hanging out um, around the, the uh, tribal states in there. And so what happened was every time summer came along, Pan would, quote-unquote, go to Hades. So the god, Pan the god, would go to Hades, and it wouldn't rain for a few months. Now, what the people thought is in order to get, to get Pan back from Hades, because they thought, what if Pan likes visiting his dad so much he never comes back? If Pan never comes back, then he doesn't start the flow of the water again, and we can't water our crops, and everybody's going to die. So what they conjured up in their brain was in order to allure Pan back to the world, back to where we are, back to the ancient Near East, into the Israel area, they would have these like sexual festivals where if anything went. Right? You, would, you, you would put your son or your daughter, you'd throw them in the middle of a festival. Guys, girls, whatever it was, they were just all these huge orgies that would happen. doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter anything. There'd be sex with goats, there'd be bestiality. I, I, when I say no rules, I mean like no rules. Like they would have this big phallic parade where they'd make a big phallic symbol. There's no other way of saying it. And then they would like parade it on the street and people would like worship it while they were having sex. And this is just, it's all in broad daylight. Right? So it wasn't like this underground like German club, like, mm, mm, let's have sex. It was like out in front of everybody. Okay? And Jesus decides this is where he is going to make a promise that lasts more than 2,000 years. Some reason, Jesus is walking around and he's like, yeah, we'll do it right here. This is a great place to make this promise. I've gotten to stand here. I've gotten to go to Caesarea Philippi. It's basically Las Vegas on steroids. Okay, so what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. This place didn't even have that rule because no one cared. It was like, what happens in Caesar and Philippi, you, you don't have Instagram, you like, you'd write it on stones, and you'd be like, look what we did. Uh, that's not true. You'd like, your selfie would take like four and a half hours. You're like, gosh, dang it. That's not what one does. It's like, anyway, so they would, they would finish these big festivals. So Jesus is standing there with his disciples in uh, Matthew chapter 16, and here's what he says. Uh, 16 verse 13 begins like this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, okay, so now, if I'm Paul in the first century, and I'm going, and I'm uh, uh, teaching about who this Jesus was, and I'm telling the stories that Jesus went through, right? I've been, I now know the, the Gospels. I, I have access to the, to the different writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And people begin to walk around and, and tell these stories. 
Um, in the first century AD, in a very nice Jewish or Gentilic society, if I would just start with that phrase, you all would have gone, because <gasps> my first phrase was, when he just came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, you would have all gone, what was he doing there? Right? It's like when a pastor takes his kid to Las Vegas and everyone's like, are you begging the Satan to come into your life? <laughs> I, I kid you not. One time Chris Brown took his kids to Las Vegas, I thought people were going to murder him. I'm like, yeah, that's godly. <laughs> you, went to, you went to Las Vegas, we're going to kill you. <laughs> that makes sense. Here's what he asks. He asks the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Okay, so he's speaking the third person. Who do people say that I am? Well, they replied, verse 14, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. Then Jesus asked him, okay, I guess my real question was, like, who do you say that I am? Okay, Simon Peter answered, which if you were at Tri-City this last week, we learned that Peter's the one who answers way before he ever should. He just, he just he never shuts up. And so he's going to do it too this time. But for once, he gets the answer right. And he says, you are the Messiah, you are, you are Meshiach, that means the anointed one. Uh, basically, the idea that that word in uh, in the Hebrew, in the Aramaic tense, they would have used it here, although it's transliterated in the Greek and the Septuagint, that's neither here nor there. What that word means is, um, if you were going to become king, they would take this horn of oil and they would pour it on your head. The symbol symbolism was that you were the next in line to rule. So everyone was waiting. All the Jewish nation, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, was waiting for the Meshiach, for the Anointed One. Who is God going to proverbially anoint with oil and say, you are the one that's going to bring the kingdom here? And so Peter says in front of everyone, now hundreds of people have come before claiming to be the Messiah. So everyone is hesitant to claim that he is the Messiah because a time and time again, they've watched people claim they were the Messiah, then they die and they stay dead. Then they claim they're the Messiah, then they die and they stay dead. So Peter... You notice how people don't jump to say anything, but Peter's there, he goes, I think you're the Messiah. And everyone else is like, it's like that unwritten thing when you're sitting in a group, like everyone's thinking it, and no one's saying it out loud. He says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. J son of John, that was a lie. Son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Didn't, you did not learn this from any human being. Now, I tell you that your name is now Peter, Petros. In the Greek, it means rock. And upon this rock, not upon Peter, okay? So the rock is the truth. Peter was renamed rock because of the truth that he professed, not because of who he was. You would be really hard-pressed, again, Tri-City people, we looked at Peter's life this whole last week, no one would be like, you know what? That Peter guy was a real rock. Right? Jesus goes to the cross, and what does Peter do three times? Denies him. So Jesus isn't going, you know what, you are the epitome of faithfulness. No, he said, but what you just spewed out of your mouth for once was actually the rock, this truth. You are Peter, rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not be able to overcome it. Okay? The Septuagint writes it as, the gates of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. One of the craziest things is this. It, the, the fact that Christianity escaped the first century AD is, is a miracle in and of itself. It literally rivals the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, the lame walking, people coming back from the dead. The miracle of this gospel escaping first century AD is 100% is, is miraculous. Because here's a situation that you have. You have these 12 apostles that are terrified because Jesus gets captured. They're hiding in a room. Jesus comes back, and he says, look, I am alive. They put their hands in the, in the holes where his, the nails were, and they send them out. And then all of a sudden, what we jump right to is we jump to, oh, and then that is what started, and now everyone knows about God. That's not what happened. Peter gives his Pentecost sermon, but then the whole Christian movement is almost snuffed out completely. You've got different people that are rising to power. You've got Nero, who burns Rome, and he blames on the Christian. All the Christians. 
He has a place called Nero Circus where if you profess to know Jesus or to follow Jesus or to believe in Jesus or that, that series of events happened, you get thrown into this, uh, this big theater, basically. And people would pay money and eat popcorn while you got slaughtered. If you were a Christian in the first century, it was amusing to watch you die. And now you got 12 people who are told to take this gospel to the ends of the earth Meanwhile, the one who comes to power is the one who wants to snuff it out. And it's not like Peter's educated. He's a fisherman. And he's got the task. And I think Jesus gives them the task, these 12 people. You've got a tax collector, right? You've got Peter. You've got a, a, a few different fishermen, but none of which are extremely smart. How do we know that? Because none of them were called out of rabbi school. So none of them were learning. None of them were educated. They were all called out of professional work. If you were in professional work back then, you were doing the profession of your father because you weren't smart enough to go to school. And for some reason, Jesus goes, hmm, you're going to carry out the greatest game plan in the history of the world. Not because it made sense. He didn't call those who were qualified. He qualified those who were called. And that's who we are. And that's the, the purpose that we have. See, the, the movement's almost completely snuffed out. There's only a few hundred Christians left. And they're not even in Jerusalem. And so God decides he is going to get a first round draft pick. He's not concerned that they believe in Christ yet. He's concerned that their motivation is not persuasive. So he calls this man named Saul of Tarsus. When I say call, I mean he makes him. He punches him off of his donkey when he's on his way to Damascus. He blinds him. And then he sends him to a town where he has to sit blind for a few days until he understands who Jesus is. Jesus himself knocks him off the donkey. Just imagine that, right? Like, Jesus would never do that. <clears throat> yeah, he would. He just walked up and he was like, <laughs> but it was a light, but you know, Jesus is a light. You know, by the world, John 1. So he yeah, like, pushes him off, and he's blind, right? You're like, Jesus is kind of a jerk. He's all, <laughs> like, imagine falling off your donkey in the ground, and you can't see anything, and Jesus is like, perfect. Okay? <laughs> you need to open up your brain to who Jesus is, because that's not what we were taught in Sunday school. Don't push. Jesus wouldn't push. Yes, he did. Don't throw rocks at people. They could go blind. Jesus made people blind. Don't ever make that excuse. I'm going to call from an angry parent this week. My son threw a rock. They're blind. He said, you told him Jesus did it. Please don't. Please don't do that. Jacob Harper, I'm talking to you. He's <laughs> laughing a lot on everybody else. So Matthew 16, Jesus is saying, he's pretty much making a prophecy. He's going, look, I'm going to establish this church. That church is, the, is big C. Okay, it basically means it's a people group. Jesus didn't go, and now I'm going to build a structure. And no one's ever going to take it down. No, Jesus said, I'm going to start a movement. I'm going to start a people group. And they will never, ever, ever be snuffed out. They're going to last through Nero's persecution. They're going to last through every other realm of that. They're going to last through the Crusades. You go, well, Crusades were great for Christians. Everyone was dying if they were Christian. That was the worst after the Crusade uh, era, after Constantine, was the worst period of Christianity, almost rivaling the first century AD. You see, when Jesus established the people group and told them to go and be the church, he never meant rule anything. He didn't mean, in order to rule, go put yourself in political positions and inflict Christianity on other people. But we have taken that. We've taken that, that great commissioning from Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations. And we're like, you got it, Jesus. Here's what I'm going to do. I am going to vote in such a way that everyone must become Christian. I will tell you how to live. I will tell you who to love. I will tell you all these other things. I'm not going to delve into all that political structure. My simple point is this. Christians are known so much more in our culture for what they vote for than who they are. We are, more, we are known more for what we don't do than what we do. Why is it that when someone finds out that I'm a Christian, they automatically go to, oh, so you don't smoke? Why don't they turn to, you're a Christian, oh, so you'll take care of me. Oh, you're a Christian, so you love well. Oh, you're a Christian, so you can overcome certain... Oh, you're a Christian, so you persevere. Oh, you're a Christian, so you have faith in God. So, oh, but initial thing that they go to is that. Why? Because the church has done a terrible job of representing who we are supposed to be representing. 
And so I'm postulating this. I think the church as it stands, the structure, this thing that has happened, I think it's time to let it die. I don't mean this people group. I mean the idea of the Christian church in America. And whether we want it to or not, guys, it's on its way out. You're like, well, 70% of Americans identify that they believe in God. 70% of Americans believe in a God. Do you want to know the number of, of evangelicals in America that regularly go to church and practice their faith? Self-reportedly, the, the percentage of people in America who not only claim to believe in God, they claim to believe in the God of the Bible, and they are actively involved in their faith, even insofar as obeying it. This is self-reported. Anyone want to guess what percentage it is? Seven. Get some. Two points for Gryffindor. Or is it Hufflepuff? Slytherin? You would be Slytherin. Seven percent. And that's on the decline. You want to know what's going up in America? Basically, the idea of, I don't really identify with any religion. That's going up. Mormonism is, is actually perfectly straight. Which I, don't, I don't even know how that works, but it's cool. Like in the last however many years, they are the exact same. So I don't know, I don't know how that works. But Mormonism, this is cool. Mormonism in the last 20 years, they, they're ethnically diverse up 0.5%. Go That's a fun fact I just learned today when I was saying. So, but here's the, the be all and end all of it. Here's what we need to do. We need to have an op autopsy of the Christian church. It, it's, it's dead. It's there before us with all of its accoutrement, its stained glass, its little bake sales, and uh, the way that it has marginalized people and the judgment nature of different people groups and it's dead on this table in front of us. In this series, what I want to do is let's find out why it died so it doesn't happen again. Let's find out why the Christian church as we know it has died so that as this people movement, as this new revival, that you guys get to be a part of. You guys get that? You are the new church. You get to pen what you'll be known for. Unfortunately, the generation that is dying off, their name tag in Christianity is of abuse. It's of hate. It's of uh, bipartisanship. There's a lot of stuff that goes in as a part of it. What do you want to be known for? And so what I want to do is I want to dissect what happened, what caused this to die, and how can we improve it as we move forward. That's what it's called the autopsy. So... Don't get weirded out by that. I didn't. I couldn't find a better word picture for it, but that's what we're going to use. Okay. So here's what I want to give you: four points of why it died, and then four points of how to revive it. Okay. Four points of why it died. I'll go slow so you guys can write down. Uh, I'll give you Bible verses too. We don't have enough time to turn to all of them, but I'll turn to the most significant ones as for our message today. You can write the rest of them down and look them up later. Where we went wrong. Okay? As we start to dissect this uh, autopsy, this cadaverous church, what happened? Okay, so uh, week one, here's going to be our main overarching theme. We had the wrong game plan. Okay? We chose the wrong game plan. The death of the church, one of the biggest reasons that it happened, we're going to do a four or five part series until our next community night, and, but the week one we're going to focus on is the reason that the church has died as we kind of cut out its heart, I guess, and looked at it, you know, you, you're like, oh, they smoked. Well, instead of them smoking, it's, oh, they had the wrong game plan. Oh, this is where the church died. They messed up the, the point. They had the wrong game plan. First thing that we did, we divided. Okay? So after, under what went wrong, point number one, we divided. We divided. Why? The church, especially after the Crusades, is so strong. You have to continue to grow until Catholicism, the, the word Catholic basically means universal. So I don't always think of like the Pope and like, oh, right, even. It was originally <laughs> Catholic men. Sorry. I wasn't making fun of Catholics. I, said, I don't know any other chance. Uh, hoc, hoc est corpus meum. Uh, that means here is my body. By the way, this is a tangent. I didn't want to say it, but now it won't get in my brain. 
Uh, the, where we get the term hocus pocus is from when kids used to sit in church and the, the priest would come up before the, the table, right, the, the bread and the wine, and then he would say these Latin phrases and then it was supposed to transform it from bread and wine into the actual body and the blood of Jesus. Okay, so because Catholics believe in transubstantiation, which means the, the bread and the wine physically take on the attributes and accidents of, uh, of body and blood. Okay? Even so far as uh, earlier in this century, or in the, in the 20th century, uh, if you were taking communion at some Catholic churches, they would tell you you can't bite the bread because it'll start to bleed. It was weird. Anyway, that's transubstantiation means it actually changes. Now, North Coast Church, we believe in what's called symbolic presence. So that when you take uh, the communion at one of our venues or whatever, it's remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. So there's not, we're not eating body or anything else like that. Okay? But when the priest would have the, the bread and the wine, and he was supposed to transform it into the body and the blood, uh, the phrase for here is my body was hocus corpus meum. And so that's where they used, they, they thought he was saying hocus pocus. And so that's where we get the term like, oh, say hocus pocus, and it'll transform from one thing to the next. Never mind. What is it? Like, hocus pocus, and it changed, or hocus pocus, and it disappeared. It's from hocus corpus meum, which means this is my body. Now on the things you actually wanted to know, maybe. The divided, we divided into political uh, groups, we divided into denominations, we became bureaucratic, we started lobbying for different things that had nothing to do with Christianity, right? He says, go and make disciples of all nations, and we went right to the voters booth. Huh. And we were like, let's start oppressing people and making everyone look like me, right? Everyone needs to look like, you guys got to understand the history of the church is, is it's, it's tainted. It's like some of the, you guys this family tree where you're like, oh, don't look at that. That's ugly. Like, don't look. That's, that's Bill the butcher. He, he, he wasn't a butcher of cows. He was a butcher of people. We don't even worry about that side of the family. That's, and there's crazy Aunt Jane. She's married to crazy Uncle Bill. You'll notice they had the same last name prior to marrying, which is super weird for everybody. They were brother and sister. But that's, that's you know, part of the family tree we don't look at, right? We have all these, guys, that's what the church is like. In other words, if people criticize the church, they've got so much ammo. We use the Bible to validate the ownership of slaves. We use Scripture to oppress people. We use Scripture in the Crusades. We murdered hundreds of thousands of people because they weren't Christians. As if that was Jesus' goal. Listen, ask them if they're believers. If not, just please slaughter them. That's the best way to make the proportions easier. Instead of having to witness to people, if you kill everyone who's not Christian, your percentages go up, right? If you kill the non-believers, then the believers, proportionately, they actually raise, okay? Under the guise of being a Christian. And you continue on, and you get all these different oppressive states. You've got, they've got ammo. We divided. That was our problem. Number two. This one's going to be a little controversial, but here we go, right? <laughs> Number two, we, we refocused, or we lost focus. That's a better word for it. We lost focus. But it's not like we didn't focus on anything. We refocused on something else. I, I get that some of you are involved in stuff like this, and so I'm sorry if this hurt your, hurt your feelings, but I'm going to say it anyway because I don't really know. I'm going to say it, though. Social justice issues have become one of the main killers of the Christian church. Social justice issues have become one of the main killers of the Christian church. What's a social justice issue? Uh, um, uh, invisible children is social justice. Um, uh, animal, uh, like protecting animals in Afghanistan or whatever kind of social justice issues. All of, that's, that's what we mean when we say social justice. Well, what do you mean? So you say those are bad things? No one said those are bad things. But here's what happened. People confused compassion and generosity for evangelism. People confused compassion and generosity over here for evangelism. Here's what I mean by that. If you guys ever participate in a social justice issue that does not deal with the problem of sin, the repentance of the person, and ultimately bringing them to life everlasting in Jesus Christ, whatever you do, whatever time you spend is absolutely worthless. Worthless. 
How do I know that? James 4.14 says that this life is a vapor in the wind. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. If we go and we go, I want to feed you, but I'm not going to tell you about the redemptive nature of Jesus. I'm not going to tell you that you've got sin and that you need saving from it. All I've done is postpone your vapor. All I've done is prolong the process by which they enter hell. That's all I've done. We have stopped supporting different organizations that are, that, that are central to sending out missionaries and promoting the good news because, on the other hand, we want to help people eat. Is eating good? Yes. Is it a great thing? Yes. But if there's food without the bread of life, it is not worth anything. I know some of you, I'm going to get the emails like, well, I do this all the time. That's totally great. But Jesus, here's what he did. He met a need, but at the same time, he called out sin. Jesus never just walked up to someone and was like, you can't see, can you? Pop! Ah, and he walked away. <laughs> right? Woman called adultery. He saves her. Miraculously, he's walking forward, and he says the perfect thing at the perfect time to get a mob of people to not throw rocks at her and eventually murder her. And then he turns around, and he says, go and sin no more. The woman at the well, Jairus' daughter, all these other situations, he doesn't simply meet a need, he meets a need, but also teaches sin and salvation. And so what we became focused on was all these social justice issues that we became so known for being simply compassionate that we forgot to teach them about Jesus. And slowly what that led to was this idea that church is simply about generosity and not about Jesus. So you have people who are trading in their weekend services, getting together, doing life together, reading the word, because they're going on these different mission trips that have nothing to do with the mission of Jesus. Social justice, is it important? 100%. Is it great? Is it a great thing to do? Yes, but always partner it with the redemptive nature of Jesus. Because if you don't, all you're doing is prolonging someone's sneeze. Right? The vapor in the wind, our life is just a sneeze. It's a spritz of Febreze. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. Do not waste anybody's time. If you are a Christian, do not waste your time simply meeting a need if it doesn't bring them into a relationship with Jesus. See, well, that's hateful. No, here's what's hateful. Handing someone food and not telling them that when they die, they will suffer an eternity apart from Jesus. That's hateful. You part of the two things? Go. Feed people. But part of that with it. We became refocused on what was not central. Number three. This is one of my favorite ones because I am so guilty of it, it's not even funny. I'm actually guilty of all of these. I might as well be speaking to a mirror. I say it all the time, but I mean it. Number three. We answered questions no one was asking. That is my favorite one. I do this all the time. We answered questions no one, was a no one was asking. We spent our time as churches circling up and shooting inwards at each other while the rest of the world remained unsaved and we weren't evangelizing. And when people looked into our little community, all they saw was us ripping each other apart mm. and dividing each other further. Are you a uh, predestination or a free will? Do you believe in transubstantiation or consubstantiation or the real presence? Or do you believe in symbolic presence? Or what do you believe in? That? Okay, so if you are, are you pre-dispensational amillennialist? Are you post-dispensational amillennialist? Are you a millennialist? Are you a non-millennialist? Or what are you? And every time we get an answer, we made a new church. Do so you know how many different organizations you can set up with that only that many characteristics? Post, pre-trib, all the, let's say there's four of those. How many different ways are there to practice the communion? Five, there's nine. Some nerd in here doing that, right? There's nine things, each of which can get paired to one another and create a different church. And we did it. How many stinking churches do we have? So what we started to do is we started to fight against each other as if we had different goals. Do you guys have drums at your church? Mm, we need to separate one more time. So what do you do? Okay, so let me explain this to you. I'm a predispensational amillennialist. I believe in the real presence of Jesus. We have drums at our church. We don't have drums at our church, and um, and seven these seven other things that make no freaking difference. Oh, seven, number seventy six. You disagree? Please make a new church. Thank you. So there's like eight people out of our church, and we're like, this is hard. Well, it's hard because we're supposed to be together. 
What's important is this. What is the rock? The rock is this. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says, this is what I build my church on. Not, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, and it really matters to me whether you believe in all these other 57,000 things. But instead of building our church on that rock and living amongst each other, even though we have differences, every time we had a difference, we separated and so we're sitting there fighting a war betwixt one another while the rest of the world is fighting against us and we're wondering why our church is dying. You fight a war where the cavalry and your artillery and your infantry are all fighting each other. If I'm the other general and I'm walking in to fight you, but you're all one army fighting each other, I just stand there and go, we can just wait. Shoot the cannon. <laughs> I love what they do. Because they're all people. They don't understand. Shoot him! Shoot him! Uh, There's his family. This is idiot. Right? That's literally what the, the rest of the world is doing. They're laughing at us because instead of standing together, we're separating and shooting each other. We're the only species that eats our own, I think. We're like, ooh, I'll eat you for breakfast. Why? Because you don't believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. <laughs> I'm the most guilty party on this, okay? So some of you guys are like, what? You, you know all those things about what you are. Yeah, I do. Because I'm a, I'm a, I, sometimes I really miss the point of church. Okay? So this is, I'm just letting you know. Number four, we built walls instead of trampolines. We built walls instead of trampolines. We became wall people, not trampoline people. What does that mean? We ended up building walls and chucking things at people, telling them to stay out of our church, instead of being trampoline people who just invite people to come jump with us. Right? Somewhere we missed the point of the cross. It wasn't get perfect and then come in my doors. Jesus says, come to me all who are weak and heavy burdened and I will give you rest. Not go search somewhere else in the world to become restful and perfect. And then once you're white, straight, and all these things agree with us, you may enter. As if God's purpose is that we're all heterosexual white people. But that was the stains of the church for a long time. It's disgusting. And that's part of our legacy. Part of our legacy that I suggest we let it die. Why? What was his game plan? Four things, really quick. Number one, love. Number two, intrigue. Number three, inquire. Number four, surrender. Love, intrigue, inquire, and surrender. Here's his game plan. Here's his marching orders that he gives to people when he leaves the planet. Okay, There's a hundred thousand ways to save the planet, right? Here's what Jesus came up with. And I think it's perfect if we did it correctly. Here's what he says. John 13, verse 35. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. In other words, you know that whole Ten Commandment thing? Are those important? 100%. But if you do this correctly, you don't even need them. I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. In other words, they will know that you are my disciples, you are my followers, that you are Christians because of the way that you love one another. So God's game plan was this. Listen, church, you people. You people right in here. Here's your goal. You take care of each other. That's it. You take care of each other. Well, what about the poor and the homeless? We'll get to them. First, you take care of each other. You take care of each other so well. You love each other so well. You give to one another according to they had needs so well. When someone shows up to your growth group, you listen and care for them and give them solace and comfort so well. That at least the point number two, that they become intrigued. You take care of each other so well that the rest of the world goes, excuse me, what the frick is going on? You had a problem, and without giving them any money or anything, they just took you into their home? Whoa, 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 whoa. okay, so hold on. You, you, on... It was your own fault that this happened, and yet people are still going to help you pay for the, the problem that happened. Is that true? Yes. What are you all smoking? You 
Church people, what are you, are you all high? Why are you doing this? Why do you give up one, two hours a week to go learn from a mentor figure that is older than you, and what are they doing there? What are those? <laughs> what are those? <laughs> if you look around this room, you're going to see a lot of growth group leaders. Growth group leader, growth group leader, growth group leader, growth group leader, growth group leader. They're all back there. They're normal people. They carry normal jobs. They're incredible. They're popular. They have a lot of friends. They have a lot of other things they could be doing. And they spend two hours a week sitting around with high school students just to love and take care of them. What are you doing? The rest of the world should look at that and go, that doesn't make any sense to me, but I want to know more. And they come and they sit in that circle and they go, okay, all right, what's going on here? Does he like dole out money or something? No, it's just Joe Green just sits and hangs out with us. Why does he sit and hang out with you? Do you like, do you like garden for him or something? No. He just, he just does it because he wants to. Nah, okay, okay, joke's on me. Seriously, how much does the church pay him? Church does not pay him anything. Really doesn't pay him anything. Uh, couldn't afford to pay him anything, right? He's, I mean, once a semester, we take him out to BJ's and he gets some ice cream, but like a pizuki, but that's it. And Joe only pays for it. <laughs> we love each other in such a way that the rest of the world gets intrigued and they go, what's going on? This is his game plan. Doesn't this take a burden off of you? That God's game plan wasn't, Jack, go get everybody in the world and bring them to church. You would never move. It's, it's paralysis. You'd go, forget it. That's huge. So here's his game plan. Katie, love them. Just, just them. Do that. Who else in your growth group? Take care of them in a way that's so radical that when other people look at your growth group, they go, what is going on? That's all you got to do. We've made the message, we've made the, the marching order so big that we haven't done anything. We've made it so obscured and so large that we all sit still and we're like, mm, it's too big of a task. Let me make it small for you. This is what Jesus said. You love them. You love them. Joe, love your family, and that's it. Love your family and those that you are closest to. That's all you got to do. Uh, you guys over here, love one another. Chandler, love your growth group. You guys do that. You should do that well. That's all you got to do. That's it. What will happen naturally is people will want in. And when they want in, that's number three, inquire. They will inquire. They're going to ask questions. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says very clearly, always be prepared to give an answer for anyone who asks what the hope is that lies within you. You love radically enough that they go, wait, what's going on here? They find out that no one has an agenda outside of just loving one another. Once they find that out, they're going to ask, so wait, why do you do this? And you go, oh, I'm glad you should ask. I'm broken. I was lost. And because of his love for me, he adopted me into his family. Now I have found completion. I know who I am and whose I am and where I'm going. That's why. And last but not least, surrender. That they would then come to a place where they surrender their lives because of the way that the church loved one another. That is his game plan. His game plan was not everyone become a great speaker so we can speak people into heaven. It was everyone love well, that they would be intrigued, they would ask about it, and ultimately we would be able to lead them through the Holy Spirit to surrender. And that's that, again, that's Peter. He's, he's an idiot, right? He does dumb stuff all the time. In the Peter in the Bible, not you, Peter. Very cute. Okay, <laughs> Peter in Scripture. But then it says on Pentecost he preaches and three thousand are saved. We're like he must have given the greatest message ever. Here was Peter's message. Peter's message was this: Jesus came as God. You people killed him. Now say that you're sorry. That was it. That was his whole message. We're like, what a genius. No, that's what that wasn't what it was. They watched the way the rest of the world watched the way that they loved one another, the way they took care of one another their fellowship, their discipleship, that when Peter stood up and said, you guys want in? Here's what happened. Jesus came to this planet. He was God. Y'all murdered him. Now say you're sorry. 3,000 people were baptized that day. Because when we carry out the mission of God correctly, we watch his kingdom grow. 
When you water the plant and give it correct sunlight, you're going to watch it grow. When you put a fern in the desert, it's going to die. That's what we've been doing. That's what the church did. God said, here are the orders to make this thing grow. You don't need, it doesn't need more help. Just do exactly this. And we try to do it on our own. And we watch the death of the Christian church. It's now time to resurrect it, though. Let the building and the structures and what we knew about, about the Christian church die. And we are going to revive it and say, here's what we're going to do from now on. We're going to commit to loving one another in such a way that it intrigues people. They're going to inquire and will ultimately lead them to a point of surrender. Not because we're trying to add to our number for the sake of adding to our number, but because we know every time someone surrenders their life to Christ, they spend eternity with them in heaven. That's why we do what we do. It's not like we need more people in this room on a Wednesday night. If you've been here lately, it's like people should start leaving because there's way too many people. <laughs> but every person in this room represents a soul, and a soul represents something that's eternal. And we want those eternal souls to be forever with Jesus, and that's why we do what we do. I don't get paid more money if more people show up. But I'd love to face my father one day in heaven and hear him say, what did you do with what you were giving? But he's not just going to ask pastors that. Because here's what it says in scripture. Did you not know that you are pastors? You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You've been set apart. It's your job to carry out this commission. Pastors can't love everyone like that. All they do is teach to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to do. I am not the church. You are the church. We are the church. May we love in such a way that we are intriguing, and when they inquire, we know how to lead them to surrender. That will create this new church body that is healthy and thriving. Let's pray. God, we're tired of doing church our own way. We're tired of, of messing up your message. We're not going to stop messing it up. Not on purpose, but whenever imperfect people hold a perfect message, we're not going to do it perfectly. But may we do it well enough. May we love well enough that people on the outside want to be a part of it for once. May we at least change that. That church is synonymous with love instead of hate. Mm. That we still call sin, sin. That we still hold strong to our morals that we believe this Bible is inerrant and every last word of it is true. But that we live it out in such a way that other people want to be a part of it. And there we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys want to be a growth group? Chunk?